SpaceX Raptor is introduced as a reusable, powerful engine that will power the Starship launch system to colonize Mars. This is something that's never been done successfully before. And there's the fact that SpaceX has not achieved it either. The problem can only be summed up in two words, reusable, powerful. Let's discuss everything about this in today's episode of Alpha Tech. Let's talk about powerful first. You'll probably see this clearly. It took the FAA more than a year to review the impact of the Starship flight. NASA worries SpaceX's Starship could destroy its launch pad, and SpaceX hasn't simultaneously tested 33 Raptor engines. A single Raptor 2 produces 510,000 pounds of thrust. To compare, F-1 engine had 1.5 million pounds of thrust. But the most important thing is with all 33 Raptors at full throttle, Starship is producing 7,600 tons or 16.7 million pounds of thrust at liftoff, beating the most powerful rocket. Saturn V uses five F-1 engines in the first stage. Its power is extremely barbaric. You know, Rocketdyne has designed the F-1 engine for several years, and they did that before for the U.S. Air Force. But after the Air Force couldn't find a use for the powerful engine, development stopped until NASA came along. And SpaceX has been definitely facing many tough issues with dozens of Raptors on Starship. Now let's turn to the other word. One definition of a reusable rocket engine is simply one that can be fired more than once in succession. Pretty much all the legacy era engines that people discuss meet this criteria. The fact is that even non-reusable engines are often kept on test stands for months at a time as part of the development or certification test or acceptance efforts that are all designed to accomplish one thing or another. It's by no means unusual to have several dozen test firings on a single non-reusable engine. So what are the challenges in making a Raptor engine and giving it a long life and making it truly practical to operate over that long life? Honestly, anything that's required to work repeatedly in extreme conditions is more difficult to do than something that's only required to perform for a few minutes, which is the typical runtime of an orbital booster. The biggest and most troublesome component is the turbo pumps. Most rocket engines are an open cycle design where fuel and oxidizer are bled off the main system to drive a twin centrifugal pump via turbine. The exhaust from that process is dumped outside the engine bell and can be seen as a trail of black smoke as they're usually designed to be very fuel rich. Being fuel rich helps keep temperature down but even so, the turbine blades and seals are still subject to high temperature and stress, which can destroy fine tolerance components quickly. More sophisticated designs like the SpaceX Raptor use a fully closed cycle system, which actually has an individual turbo pump each for fuel and oxidizer. Going for a fully closed cycle means the engine is more efficient since all the fuel and oxidizer are sent to the main combustion chamber and nothing is wasted. That means one of your turbo pump turbines has to run on a lean mixture, greatly raising the combustion temperature. Until recently, the Americans thought it was impossible, although the Russians had perfected the material technology to withstand the temperature for years in those RD engines. Either way, you need to have a very highly stressed bearing shaft and seal that can withstand some extreme conditions repeatedly. Another consideration is the need for reusable rocket engines to restart, which is not often a consideration for a single-use engine. This involves extra complexity, which means more things can go wrong. This doesn't even begin to look at the bell design, which has to be capable of withstanding the combustion temperature that's generated within the main chamber without cracking. Once again, the more heat expansion and contraction cycles the bell has to go through, that means yet more investment in material and design. Basically, we're talking about a machine that has to work at the absolute limit of the material used using the minimum amount of mass and still be in serviceable condition after a flight that might require several start-stop cycles. Then another important thing is the difficulty of getting the engine back to Earth in any usable shape at all. SpaceX plans to catch Starship with Mechazilla Towers, but as explained many times, this is more insane stuff. The Space Shuttle's Solid Rocket Booster, or SRBs, were labeled as reusable. To enable this reusability, three large parachutes were used to lower the SRB gently to the ocean. In fact, things were considerably different. The SRB splashed down in the ocean on its aft skirt. It so happens that the majority of the high-dollar SRB hardware is in the aft skirt. This is where the guts of the SRB flight control system are located. 
The required impact velocities were computed so as to not impose overly large loads on the SRB hardware. On the first flight, STS-1, upon recovery and disassembly of the SRBs, the entire contents of the aft skirt of both SRBs were found to have been destroyed by the splashdown load. This phenomenon repeated itself on the second and third flights. The fourth flight lost its SRBs due to a recovery system failure. The loss of this hardware on every single flight was not allowed for in the shuttle program's budget, so considerable effort was put forth to try to figure out what's going on here. More than one distinguished Tiger team was formed to solve this problem once and for all. Sadly, none of the vaunted Tiger teams made any significant progress at all. The source of the very high splashdown load remained mysterious. There were stopgap measures put in place to protect the SRB flight control system hardware from a very high splashdown load, but the return on that effort was modest at best and cost an enormous amount of time and effort in ground preparation prior to the flight and SRB disassembly after the flight. Even when SpaceX brings Raptor back successfully, the question comes about, how is a reused engine going to be flight certified? It turns out that's a tricky, tricky question. If the criteria for flight certification for a reused engine is the same as that of a new engine, it implies that all of the same tests starting at component level are performed as they would be for a new engine. You've probably heard a lot of stories about the space shuttle main engines, SSMEs, having to be rebuilt between flights. Many of these statements are untrue, but it's true that the inspections required of an engine were numerous and we often erred on the conservative side, such as replacing a component when the results of an inspection were ambiguous. NASA then ran vicarious checkout tests on the components that were replaced and ran a series of full-up simulation tests on the entire engine, which fairly well duplicated the initial checkout test for that engine. The COFR for the SSMEs could then be signed based on the subjecting of the reused engine to essentially a full set of new engine checkout tests. The above description was an attempt to explain how NASA made the SSME formally reusable. In summary, the engine's fully capable of numerous firings to begin with, and so is reusable without adding further trimming. However, the flight certification process that accompanies a reused engine had to be conducted to the same standard of rigor that's applied to a new engine. And finally, when people think about reusable engines, it means less expensive. Actually, that's entirely false. In fact, the shuttle program results can be used to argue that reusing space hardware is actually more expensive than building new hardware if the flight certification standards for reused hardware are the same as for new hardware. The hard part of space hardware that's expensive is not the aluminum, steel, and nickel that sits on the launch pad. The costs for this part are all but in the noise. The expensive part of the proposition is the size and technical capability of the workforce that's required to comply with traditional flight certification process and maintain the ability to launch on schedule and with minimum schedule slippage in the event of a problem. After all, SpaceX engineers are now applying more modern scientific research. However, overcoming all these difficulties is not possible in the near future. And that about wraps it up for today's episode. Hey, don't forget to share your ideas in the comments section. Everyone's support motivates us to create more quality video. And for that, we thank you so much and hope to see you next time.